that's enough from me. Uh, we'll start with tonight's event. It gives me great pleasure to welcome this evening's speaker, Professor Adrian Dixon, uh, who's popped down from Cambridge today to speak to us all, uh, despite it being his birthday, uh, <laughs> which is a really lovely gesture. Um, for those of you who don't know, Professor Dixon is currently the master of Peterhouse, which is uh, the smallest college that makes up the University of Cambridge. Um, and he's Emeritus Professor of Radiology, having been head of the University Department of Radiology for 15 years. He retired after 35 years as an honorary consultant radiologist at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge uh, in September of last year. From an Irish background, he was born in... in <clears throat> Sorry, from an Irish background uh, in Cambridge, he, he earned his bachelor's degree at King's College. He qualified as, in medicine after clinical studies at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. He then specialised in general medicine, gaining his MRCP in 1974 before deciding to pursue a career in radiology, something he, compl he claims was a, a very appropriate career choice on his point, uh, given the, his quite profound deafness. Um, he qualified as a radiologist in 1978 and worked in paediatric radiology at Great St. Ormond Street Hospital in, uh, and in computed tomography at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. In 1979, he became a lecturer at the University of Cambridge's Department of Radiology and was con a consultant at Addenbrooke's for 35 years, as I said. He earned his doctorate of medicine for his thesis on computed tomography of the lumbar spine. In 1986, he was elected a fellow of Peterhouse, where he became director of medical studies. Throughout his career, Professor Dixon has been actively engaged in the field of scientific publishing. As both an author and an editor, he was published extensively in the areas of computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and various aspects of effectiveness within radiology. In addition, he has written and co-edited various books on CT, anatomy, and diagnostic radiology. He served as editor of the Journal of Clinical Radiology from 98 to 2002, editor-in-chief of European Radiology from 2007 to 2013, and Warden of the Faculty of Clinical Radiology of the RCR from 2002 to 2006. He was also awarded Fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 1998. He received a number of awards throughout his career, and he is an honorary member of the National Radiologi Radiological Societies of France, Hungary, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and the USA. As well as being an honorary fellow at the American College of Radiology, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiologists, and the Faculty of Radiologists at the Royal College of Surgeon Surgeons in Ireland. More recently, in 2014, he was awarded the Gold Medal of the European Society of Radiology. In short, Adrian has accomplished a great many things in his profession, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome him tonight to talk us through the evolution of medical imaging techniques in this, the International Year of Light. Welcome. Carrie, thank you very much indeed, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honour to come and lecture in these august surroundings, and I'm fairly safe in saying that I know less chemistry than most of the audience, so don't pin me down too much on that. But I hope I can explain how medical imaging has progressed in the last few years, and I hope I can show you the importance of chemistry and indeed physics in trying to get the best possible images and thereby the best possible diagnoses. And um, the International Year of the Light is a bit of a misnomer. If you dig deep, it's actually and light-based technologies. And I suppose, uh, as we eventually see an image on a screen, you could say that radiology is a light-based technology. We used to have things on celluloid that we had uh, fluorescent screens behind, and we used to see images that way. But with the sort of television monitors, it's all gone digital, so we don't do that so much anymore. Anyway. Radiology and imaging is a relatively new science, and this is a problem that I have to ha uh, share with deans of medical schools to try to increase the proportion of uh, the syllabus and the curriculum to imaging because, of course, pathology, biochemistry, physiology have been there since the year dot. But radiology, of course, only started in 1895 with a new form of ray, which we didn't know what it was. And indeed, certain people were relatively cynical about this new form of ray, including a former fellow of Peterhouse, one of the most famous fellows of Peterhouse, Lord Kelvin, who didn't really believe it. He thought it was a bit of a hoax. And when it came out in November 95, he um, 
didn't really approve of it, but in March 19, 1896, he had to write a relatively spinny letter saying he hadn't really studied it properly, and of course it was a marvelous breakthrough. Anyway, this, so we've only been going 120 years in medical imaging, and um, I've been in it now for 40 years, there or thereabouts, one third of it. And rather like computing, every five years it gets more and more and more. I mean, it's just incredible the way it has gone. I hope I can talk you through that story during the next um, 50 minutes or so. So let's go back to Würzburg in 1895 with basically a Coolidge tube giving out um, this unknown ray and he saw this uh, sodium platinocyanide um, screen fluorescing at the far end of the room, and he put his wife's hand between the source and the screen. I don't think there was too much ethical approval or health and safety in those days. And of course, an image was produced, and you've probably seen the image, but it isn't a million miles away from what we're doing all day and night in casualty departments up and down the country. Because if you fall off your whatever or hit this or that, you usually have an X-ray, which in fact, apart from the radiation dose being miles lower, the detection mechanisms much more efficient, is not all that far away from what Rontgen did to his wife all those years ago. And of course, very instantly, if you know your anatomy, and if you know um, the William Hill probability of what might have gone wrong, you can um, work out the injury, and the injury is in this bone here, which happens to be the scaphoid, which is a particularly difficult injury to treat and has considerable side effects because, curiously, this proximal portion of the bone often becomes um, ischemic and gives you huge um, problems in later life. So it's a very important one to get right. So a very simple thing, costing very little really, and um, radiation dose trivial. I'll come to radiation dose in a while. Um, I'm relatively cavalier about it and it's getting less and less and less. And given the fact that you sitting in this room are receiving four millisieverts background radiation each year anyway, uh, 0.02 extra isn't going to make much difference in my parlance. But anyway, there we go. So you can imagine that for medical students, it's very easy to test their anatomical knowledge and to try to uh, get them to guess where the fracture is and to discuss the significance. So it's money for old rope when it comes to examining medical students to put in an image and say what's going wrong because you give the same image or a very similar image to lots of people at the same time. So a simple thing. And then, of course, um, people started to get on to more complicated things like the chest. And here is an early uh, radiologist looking at this fluorescent screen with absolutely no radiation safety whatsoever. And of course, sadly, a lot of the pioneers in the early days got horrible cancers, leukemias, skin cancers, etc., etc. So there's no doubt about it that radiation used in diagnostic radiology is dangerous to the performer rather than the patient. The patient isn't going to get very much, but those working in it could get a lot if you are not very, very obsessional with radiation safety. But happily, as I've explained, we didn't look at this very cost ineffective and inefficient method of capturing x-rays. We had image intensifiers, we had lead gloves, lead everything, etc., etc., coning down the beam, and the, eventually you get to the thing which is done more often than anything else, which is the humble chest x-ray. And the humble chest x-ray is a remarkably good tool at saying whether there is or isn't anything going on in the chest. It isn't perfect, and we'll come to why computer tomography is better in a while. But that chest x-ray instantly shows that all parts of the lung are aerated. You can see the vessels. Oh, sorry, can I, I, I may be going a bit too fast. This is the right of the patient. This is the left of the patient. You're looking at the patient as if you're looking at me, yeah? And um, things like the left hilar point, where all the blood vessels going out and to and fro the lungs, is always a little higher than the right hilar point. The, 
it's said that the right hemidiaphragm is higher than the left hemidiaphragm, that's the gastric air bubble. You've got three shades of white only. In straight radiography, you've got black, where the x-rays are fizzing round without being stopped by anything. You've got white, where the x-rays are stopped dead in their tracks. And you've got a bit of gray somewhere in between. And those are your only three bits of contrast, if you like, on a straight x-ray. Yes? Uh, but nevertheless, you can still tell quite a lot. For example, that is normal. And um, dare I say it, just looking at all of you, there's quite a spread of age and body habitus, etc. So no two x-rays look the same. And one of the really difficult things is knowing the natural variation, which I'll come to again. But that x-ray is normal. And an experienced radiologist would say that's normal within about 10 seconds of looking at it. And uh, it's a very interesting piece of research of how much more do you get on by looking at it for longer and longer? And do you start to pick up nodules that don't count? You know, so it's a very, um, it's an art form. That is abnormal. And that is abnormal because the right hyalur point is higher than the left, which is wrong. And it's wrong because there's a lot of shrinkage up here. And there are large circular things here full of black, which is air. The x-rays are not getting stopped. And therefore, those are cavities. And there are only really two things that cavitate. One is cancer, and one is tuberculosis. And it's quite an important to be able to spot the difference. And that, because of the shrinkage, is almost certainly tuberculosis, which we still see quite a lot of today. Indeed, there are parts of London, there are parts of Birmingham, where tuberculosis is as common in the middle of um, underdeveloped countries. So, three shades of grey. So, for example, if a patient rolls into casualty with a terrible abdominal pain, one of the things is that a bit of bowel has gone pop and has perforated and air has got out from the bowel into the peritoneal cavity, which is a fairly big emergency. Well, here, on the three shades of grey, there's the lung, there's the diaphragm, there's the liver, and there is air between the liver and the diaphragm. Therefore, there is free air. If there is free air that has leaked from the gut into the peritoneal cavity, bugs have also leaked from the gut into the peritoneal cavity. Therefore, the patient has peritonitis. Therefore, that x-ray tells me that that patient needs to go to theatre within the hour. It's a remarkable test, isn't it, to be able to be that specific. That's really cheap and cheerful radiology in fairly gross situations, that chest x-ray and that abdominal x-ray. Um, of course, there's a great skill in taking the x-ray to show what you need to do. And one of the, and you will have read about the uh, neck being a very major problem in road traffic accidents and rugby scrums and all that sort of thing. And um, we need to see the whole cervical spine. Now, when the motorcyclist or the rugby player comes in with the shoulders hunched up and lying on a trolley, it isn't that easy to get a perfect view. And here we are. Um, there is the skull, the patient's lying, so it's a cross table, portable, so the radiographer's bought the x-ray machine and is shining through from left to right. And here are the vertebral bodies and we've got the shoulders in the way of the most critical area, which is the cervicothoracic junction. And this is where skilled radiography comes in and it's a team game. The radiographer has to get the bright pictures, the radiologist has to interpret it correctly, etc, etc. And we said, could you have another go? And the more senior radiographer comes, same patient, C1, anterior arch of atlas axis, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, T1, seen beautifully. It's the most, I mean, that to me is a beautiful x-ray, whereas that is ghastly. Now, you may or may not have quite twigged to that, but you can see how important it is, this team game, to get it right. Well, then, of course, radiologists have been quite um, intrigued and have been interested in doing all sorts of things to improve the contrast. And this is where chemistry comes in. And this is, I suppose, why I was invited to come here, because various compounds are then given to patients to make 
more information available on a chest X-ray or an abdominal X-ray in this point. Now, happily, we don't have to do this very often anymore. But in the past, when I was training in 1975 as a youngster, I had to do about 12 of these a day, which was to pour air and barium sulfate, which is a fantastically inert substance, and stop X-rays dead in its tracks. And you put the barium and the air into the colon to show all the way around with a little bit of reflux into the terminal ileum, a little bit of reflux into the appendix. And on that, we used to be able to work out whether or not there was or was not a tumour in the colon or a polyp. Now, increasingly, that is now done by computer tomography and indeed invasive endoscopy. And these are superseded this. But I'm just showing, A, the fact that barium is a very useful inert compound, barium sulfate, very um, stable. Uh, really doesn't break down at all, causes no irritation to the colon, etc., 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 causes a bit of constipation, but that's not too much of a trouble. But also, I like this slide because it shows another feature. Here is the appendix, which is in this position, just posterior to the terminal ileum. When you turn the patient over, and you took these pictures in lots of different projections, uh, and here it is, the appendix has whizzed up going cranially as opposed to going caudally. And that shows the dynamic nature of the structure of organs in the abdomen. Because the abdomen is full of fat. Some people have rather more fat than others. And within that fat, which is fluid-ish at body temperature, everything's moving around and peristalsing and moving. And that is sometimes forgotten. And um, the anatomy textbooks have all been written on the basis of Victorian dissection. And I've been very keen on rewriting the anatomy textbooks in vivo rather than in post-mortem. Anyway, then we discovered that if we bound other compounds into a relatively inert form, we could give an injection into the vein, peripheral vein, and this is iodine being excreted by the kidneys to give an intravenous urogram to show the outline of the kidneys, the collecting system, the ureters, and down into the bladder. And this was the mainstay of imaging the renal tract until computer tomography came out. Now, this is where chemistry comes in again. When I was young, we only had ionic contrast agents that were pretty toxic and people vomited and there was terrible problems with not really allergy, it was more idiosyncrasies, hives, asthma was induced, etc., etc. And the chemists spent hours and hours working out less and less toxic things, and now with Iapamidol, it is really pretty inert, and we use tons of this stuff uh, on a daily basis in computer tomography, as I'll show you. Iodine stops x-rays very well. We want to get it as an inert mechanism so it doesn't dissociate, so you don't have the free iodine, and it all comes out. If the patient has reasonable kidneys, it all comes out pretty quickly. Of course, you sometimes don't know whether the patient's kidneys are working very well in advance, and that poses problems. So that is, but it's quite a slug of iodine. And again, thinking of the chemical effect of iodine, some does dissociate, and it mucks up thyroid function tests for quite a long while thereafter because the thyroxin uh, is uh, completely skewed up. Then radiologists started to get more and more adventurous, still using plain x-rays. We haven't got to CT, ultrasound, magnetic resonance, imaging, nuclear medicine, all that's to come, but um, they got more adventurous. And a medical student um, showed how you could insert a cannula into the vein peripherally and thread it back into the heart and measure, on himself he did, measured the blood pressures at various points of the cardiac cycle. <laughs> Well, using this same technique, we can thread catheters, and radiologists love feeding catheters into more and more bizarre parts of the anatomy. But here we are threading a catheter through the um, cephalic vein into the superior vena cava, through into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, through the right ventricle, through the pulmonary valve, and we are squirting iodinated contrast agents into the pulmonary arterial circulation. Now, why would we want to do that? We want to do that 
in order to see whether all parts of the lung are perfused or not. And you can see here that there is a beautiful arborizing pattern in the right upper lobe, very little in the right lower lobe, and virtually nothing getting to the left lung whatsoever. Why is that? Well, Verkoff showed that a tube can be obstructed by something in the lumen, something in the wall, or something outside the wall. This is stuff in the lumen. If you look very carefully at the main left pulmonary artery, you can see a little bit of iodine just slipping around the edge of a tubular thing filling the vessel. And this is a dreaded thing called a pulmonary embolus. If you drive non-stop from John O'Groats to Land's End without stopping, your venous system does not like that very much and you get clots in your legs and there's a quite a lot of controversy how much you get flying across the Atlantic and this, that and the other. But anyway, clots develop in the legs and they can whiz off, deep venous thrombosis can whiz off and lodge in the lungs to cause a pulmonary embolus, which is a bad thing to get, a major one, a massive one. It's, I'll come back to that in a moment. But anyway, this was a relatively horrid thing for the radiologist to do because the patient sometimes had a cardiac arrest when you put the needle through the heart and um, likewise the patient didn't think much about it either. So in a big hospital like Addenbrooke's we never really did more than about 200 of these a year. And I will show you what we do now. And then you can squirt contrast agent. Again, my uh, clever colleagues uh, can um, cannulate an artery this time and work it back into the arteries of the brain. And here is the carotid artery coming up, splitting. And there is a tiny little out pouch there, which is the offending uh, structure. So you can show on the carotid dividing into the middle and the anterior cerebral artery and the offending thing here is a uh, aneurysm, which shouldn't be there. And then, of course, these clever neuroradiologists can thread a little catheter into that and put a bit of araldite equivalent and seal it off. And the number of operations for intracranial procedures are going down, 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 because more and more can be done peripherally by uh, non-invasive, not without opening the skull, which is terrific. So that was the beginning of it all. Then came computer tomography. And as Carrie said, I did an extraordinary thing by giving up a reasonable good job in uh, Great Ormond Street to go and become a research fellow in, in computer tomography because this struck me as the most fantastic invention. And of course, Hounsfield and Cormac shared the Nobel Prize for it. Brilliant British invention for which we now no longer make these kit. That will be a recurring theme of mine. Anyway, this is a machine, and you'll see more modern machines, but basically the patient lies here, and in here is an X-ray source, and here is a bank of detectors. The X-ray source whizzes around, and the detectors measure lots of different angles, okay? And from that, you can work out and get the most fantastic cross-sectional image of the body. And here is the picture, and this is... Um, uh, 1,024 pixels that direction, 1,024 pixels that direction, and you are looking up from the feet, so that is the right of the patient, that's the left of the patient, and at this setting, you have exactly the same shades of grey as on a chest x-ray. So, black around the edge, there is the jersey, there is the shirt, you can see how the patient is brilliantly insulated by clothing, and then comes the scopocutaneous fat and all the rest. Here is the lung, the divide between the upper and lower lobe, and here are the airways, pure air, taking the lung, air out into the lungs, yes? So far, so good. And the person that got the Nobel Prize, of course, was Hounsfield with Cormac, Cambridge man. Uh, he worked for EMI in Middlesex. EMI at the time were making vast sums of money from the Beatles. And because of that, they were able to develop all sorts of things that they had no interest in whatsoever. And really, they should have gone into bed with somebody like Siemens or 
Phillips or something, but they didn't. They tried to sell it themselves. But anyway, Godfrey Hounsfield, a remarkable man, and here is his very simple scale. He said, look, in fact, he, it was half his originally, but it became uh, bone stops x-rays very well. Air doesn't stop x-rays at all. We can usually find water wherever we are in the world, and we put that in the middle of the scale, and we calibrate everything from there. And uh, the soft tissues like liver and muscle will stop x-rays quite well. Fat doesn't stop x-rays well. That's why you remember the, if you leave the washing up overnight, the fat floats to the top. Um, it doesn't stop x-rays at all well. So it's a very useful marker because it's negative, as you'll see in a moment. And here is the great man, computer-assisted tomography. The A got dropped after a while. Now, this image is shown what we call lung settings, i.e., we have got it so that the air is black, but the soft tissues are all white. Exactly the same image, just tweaking the rear stat of the image display, is that. That's exactly the same data, but displayed at a different way. Now, you can't see any difference between the air and the lungs, but you can see a faint difference, and you can see just a little bit of, there's the skin, there's the subcutaneous fat, and in the center, in the mediastinum, you can see the ascending aorta, the descending aorta, the uh, atrium, the right atrium, left atrium, etc., etc., and the vertebra, the spinal canal with the spinal cord in the middle, etc., etc., etc. I mean, just look at that range of contrast of tissues that you suddenly uh, show. And then you can show it at bone settings to get the bones. And then, of course, the advances in computing have been just dramatic, and that has allowed us to analyze the images much better. For example, if you put a patient lying on a mattress with various calibrated solutions of calcium, you can work out how much calcium there could be in the bone. So you can use it to determine whether the patient has or has not got osteoporosis, which is very fashionable at the moment. And in my area of research, I am fascinated in the calcium that people put down in their aorta and in their vessels. Oh, sorry, I could have gone back. That patient has not got good life prognosis because his left main stem coronary artery is full of calcium. It won't be passing very much blood in it. And if you want to spend about 500 pounds, you can go to Harley Street and get your coronary calcium score measured. I prefer not to know myself. I think, uh, damn all you can do. Sorry, I shouldn't swear. There's not much you can do about it. But anyway, so you can measure all sorts of things and you can see how much calcium there is in the vessel. And with clever um, computer software, you can count the number of pixels. And here we are in a coronal image. You can see more. You can get a readout and you can get a calcium score of the aorta. And that led quite recently to some work that we did showing that, surprise, surprise, calcium in the aorta is not very good news as far as hypertension is concerned. And surprise, surprise, the more heavily calcified your vessels are, the less and less antihypertensive drugs can have an effect because there's no spring in the walls of the vessels. But I mean, it's health obvious, but we didn't really get there until about six years ago. And um, you can also do all sorts of things, and this is one of my most widely paid, quoted papers, was just using fat to work out whether the patient's got too much fat in the wrong place or not. And we also, only late in the day, discovered the difference in fat distribution between a normal male and a normal female, that the females put their fat in the subcutaneous tissues, whereas the chaps put the fat in the middle in the abdomen. And if you, you can sort of uh, see all sorts of differences and you can calculate and you can work out all sorts of things. Then you can use the computer to just subtract out various things like the bones. So for trauma, pretty useful to be able to get that image of the skeleton without touching the patient, apart from about one millisievert. So a computer tomography of the computer tomogram of the body is about one millisievert for everything now. It's come down, down, down about a quarter of your natural background radiation. And in fact, there's been a lovely study in the States, and it could only happen in the States, of a series of patients that have had 100 CTs in their life. You don't get, happen to do that in the UK, and there seems to be no increased prevalence of cancer, so I'm relatively cavalier about it. Well, then, if you combine 
the beautiful anatomy of computer tomography with the iodine that I was telling you about in an inert form, you can pass the iodine through and opacify things and you can control the sequence of opacification. So here is some contrast medium in the SVC and here it is in the pulmonary artery. The little thing there that shouldn't be there. We can show it in another plane and another plane. And here, in a subdivision of a pulmonary artery, is a 2 by 4 millimeter filling defect in that vessel. That is one of the smallest pulmonary emboli that you will see. And in fact, one of the reasons why the lungs are so beautifully designed is not only for gas exchange, it's also for sieving the blood of impurities. Because you do not want things like that to go through the heart and up to your brain, because that will cause major problems. And the lungs are very important at sieving the blood in the way the liver is too. So we see more and more of these and we're uncertain what to do about them. It's quite an interesting conundrum at the moment, and I'm sure all of you have had friends on anticoagulants. How long do you do it for? Um, is it long term? Is it lifelong? Et cetera, et cetera. We don't do this anymore. This is what we used to do, I explained. We do hundreds of these per week now, literally. And we don't do this very much anymore because you need quite a lot of free air to be able to spot the perforation that I was talking about earlier, whereas with CT you can delineate tiny little crescents of free air and get on to treat the patient more urgently. Now, I've spent my life trying to defend these high technology imaging. And believe it or not, there was huge opposition when CT and indeed MR was presented to the nation. And I had to do a lot of work to show that it did help the patient and it helped the clinician and it did change management and it was going in the right direction. And curiously, two world events happened which really changed the thinking. Because in America, there was also concern about high technology and it is very expensive if you do the high-tech imaging and all the existing imaging as well. You've got to replace the existing imaging with the newer imaging. And the things that happened was, one, Reagan got shot. And CT was shown, to, to identified where the bullet was, and they got there within a few seconds to be able to get it out. And the second thing, the Pope got stabbed and got a subphrenic infection, and CT was used to get to the bottom of that problem. And from that moment, we were able to make some progress. But before that, it was quite difficult. So I've been spending a lot of time measuring the effects of imaging, and I won't bore you with how we do that, but we try wherever we can to do randomized studies. Half the patients have the higher tech imaging, half the patients don't. You have to get their permission, you have to get the clinicians on board. It's quite a party, but for the imaging in the International Year of the Light, I will take you through one of the questions that I had to be. You're familiar with the fact that the Year of the Light, Let There Be Light, came from Genesis. And as you are the RSC, I expect that you're also familiar with the Royal Society, of uh, Royal Shakespeare Society as well, because the RSC is both. And to be or not to be, I've given a lot of lectures uh, CT or not CT, that is the question. And to cut a long story short, it's CT or not to see, because CT tells you all you need to know. So for example, in this paper quite a few years ago now, we did a randomized study of patients coming into hospital with an acute abdomen. Do they have something serious? Can they be sent home? Do they need to go straight to operation? And the results for example, appendicitis. There is a swollen and inflamed appendicitis. It is really extraordinary that there are still places that in this day and age operate on appendicitis without a roadmap telling them what's going on because for a very quick amount of either ultrasound or CT, you can work out whether there is appendicitis or not. You should not be taking out lily white appendices anymore. So anyway, the study showed that there were many fewer deaths in the early CT group than the standard practice group, so QED you'd have thought. 
And really, radiology in the last 40 years has moved ahead to be the very front line of medicine. If you think about it, the clinical examination, the physical examination is fantastically subjective. Whereas, unfortunately for us, in some ways, radiology is very, is very subjective, we're very objective, and you can reanalyze the images and reanalyze the images, and that's why radiologists frequently get sued, because if you miss something, it's there for somebody. Who knows what the clinician found putting their hands on yesterday or the day before. So let's just take a patient, middle-aged man who couldn't breathe and couldn't swallow and was really at death's door. And this was the CT. So there is the airway bringing the air down to the lungs. OK on that image. Here is the gullet bringing the food down and it's dilated, much too dilated, with an air fluid level on it because the food can't get down. The reason it can't get down is there's a socking great mass here, which is also distorting the airway, pushing into the airway. So this mass is stopping swallowing and stopping air getting into the lungs. That's fairly serious on a score of 0 to 10. And here are the two main bronchi, there and there, and this mass has lifted the aorta away. Well, what is the mass due to? That's the question. We also noted a lesion in the kidney. So could it have been a kidney cancer spreading to the mediastinum, or was it a more generic type of tumor spreading to the kidney? Tricky. Again, cut a long story short, we put him on his side and put a needle in and get out the tissue, which happily for the patient was lymphoma, which is one of the best cancers to get because you can treat it with chemotherapy and it all goes away. So here is a patient that nearly was dead. CT, biopsy, diagnosis, all within X hours, and the patient cured. You couldn't have done that 20 years ago. Just couldn't have done it. Then, going on to the abdomen CT, I mustn't go too much on CT. I'm very fond of CT. Um, with the intravenous techniques, here's the liver, and there is a mass in the liver there with which, when you give the iodine, it lights up, and 30 seconds later, it's gone. Now, that pattern of rapid influx and efflux of the iodinated contrast agent tells us that it's a certain type of tumor, and it's actually a benign tumor, almost certainly, especially with this little central scar, and that's an adenoma, which is quite common um, in the female of the species at about 35 to 50 years of age, so that's good. Then, of course, clever people like uh, Ken Miles and Mike Hable had a new technique of looking at the way in which that iodine arrives and being able to see the perfusion of tissue. And this was the first time we could get perfusion maps of tissues in vivo for very little iodine and very little radiation. And that's led to all sorts of things, but classically, it has led to really remarkable things in the brain. Now, that's quite a difficult image. You can't see, I don't think, much wrong, but the really clever radiologist would say there isn't quite as many markings as there. And there may be a little thing there showing a clot. But when you look at the perfusion, you can see that the bit of the middle cerebral artery perfusion and that patient is evolving a stroke. That there is something causing that bit of brain not to be well perfused. And we can get on quickly with the diagnosis of an impending stroke now, stroke attacks you've heard about, you go in and you have the operation. And then my clever friends can do the angiogram and show that this bit of vessel is not, um, not opening out and then they can do a little bit of ferreting around and open up that vessel. And the next day, from that, much better, etc., etc. So again, the combination of diagnostic techniques, therapeutic techniques, all hanging on the imaging, has advanced enormously. And then, and now I'm going to have a bit of a party political. Um, here is England's most famous chemist, I should think. 
and I have to just say that he is, of course, a fellow of Peterhouse. Sir Aaron Clogg, President of the Royal Society, uh, one of the few people to get the Nobel Prize solo for chemistry for the methodology of uh, analysing um, X-ray crystallography, and that was the work that allowed all the Perutz, Kendrew, Crick, Watson, you name it. And he also worked very closely with Cormac, who shared the Nobel Prize with Hounsfield, if you remember, and there was great teasing between the two of them, because technically you could have argued that Aaron should have got the Nobel Prize for CT as well, because it was the same technique, actually. So when we, by Siemens, were given, not quite given, we had to pay something for it, the first 16-slice CT machine in Europe, and here it is, uh, we asked Aaron to kindly open it, because this gave a huge momentum, huge step forward in image quality. So again, if we just go forwards, this is now another brain, here are the vessels, I cannot see an abnormality on that image, I can't a neuroradiologist might, but when you come to the perfusion, you can see the abnormality from the back of the room. There it is. Tiny mini infarct. You can extract out the colon. Do you remember I showed you barium enema, running barium in? Here you can do it without touching the patient. You can pull out that almost without touching the patient. I can pull out the vertebral column. I did my um, MD thesis on very less sophisticated um, analysis than this, and that is just like looking at a skeleton. And the surgeon now has a complete roadmap of vessels in the abdomen, and then you can peel away. I see some youngsters in the front. The youngsters are very, very good at computer games, and the computer dame industry and the imaging industry have worked hand in glove to be able to virtually dissect away the front of the chest, to be able to peel back and see the heart without opening the chest. So you can really find out what is going on in there before a surgeon goes in. And this is allowing surgical to be done by image-guided techniques without opening the chest, just to get little needles in and less and less invasive surgery. And with clever techniques, you can see something like the aortic valve there, and there is a bicuspid aortic valve, not a very good thing to get, etc., etc. Enough on CT. I rap rapidly coming. I realize I've overdone CT. But anyway, we're going to ultrasound. Now, again, isn't it fascinating that ultrasound was pioneered by Lady and Donald in Glasgow? A remarkable man worked in the Navy as a ship's doctor and reckoned when he was in the Navy during the war that if you can see a whale or a submarine across the Atlantic Ocean with radar and sound, sonar, you ought to be able to see a fetus within the amniotic sac. And so he developed this technique, which has been the mainstay of obstetric um, antenatal care for the last 60 years, 20, 30 years. It's a remarkable technique, and you use sound in this sort of range, and it's cheap, it's safe, it's very operator dependent, and you have to be really good at it, and you have to be doing a lot of it to be good at it. And there are certain parts of the body that is difficult. You need water to get through, because it doesn't go through air fluid interfaces at this sound. But given a good day, Given a good patient, thin patients better than fat. Interestingly, fat patients are better than thin for CT, so they're quite um, mutually good. Ultrasound is very good for children. I used to do a lot of ultrasound. If the baby runs, you can sort of move with it, with the probe, if you see what I mean. It doesn't matter if they're squealing too much. So there, anatomically, is the spleen, and there is a nice normal spleen. So you can get fantastic detail and my colleague, Dr. Berman, in Cambridge is a world authority. He can get pictures of any part of the body. I can't. I gave up ultrasound. Much too difficult for me. You have to be really good and doing a lot of it. So, for example, here is the Atlantic Ocean, the gallbladder, and here are two structures in the Atlantic Ocean which are casting a small shadow 
and reflecting the ultrasound beam. So the beam is going in at the front and we're measuring what gets reflected back. Now this one allows sound to be transmitted through it, whereas this one does not. So this must be rock solid, that is a gallstone, whereas that must have less reflective properties and that's a polyp. So you can differentiate one from the two by certain other features. And it is very impressive. So, for example, in the liver, these are centimetre marks. There is a small lesion in the liver. And there are, in fact, quite a lot in the spleen as well. So about, what, eight millimetres across. What are they? Are they tumour? Are they cysts? Are they focus of infection? So we need to get a needle in, and here is the CT, and here am I sticking a needle into one of those, and in fact that was an abscess. It was a microabscess, as a fungal, in fact. And to be able to get that diagnosis without really a little bit of anaesthetic is not too much. I'm passing on now rapidly to magnetic resonance imaging. And another side story. I have a little um, sub-joke that I've got to spell out, Peterhouse, that's where I belong now, that you couldn't do magnetic resonance imaging without scientists from my college. I say that if you hadn't had Cavendish to measure the mass of the Earth and discover, and think about hydrogen and protons and things, if you hadn't had Babbage to do the first um, calculating machine and computer, if you hadn't had Lord Kelvin to get you down to zero absolute, you wouldn't have superconducting. If you hadn't had Lord Dewar, uh, James Dewar to get the Dewar flask and the vacuum flask to keep the magnets cool, you wouldn't be able to do superconducting. Then I say that if you hadn't had uh, Klug to do the mathematics of the reconstruction, and finally, if you hadn't had Frank Whittle to fly the parts of the magnetic resonance imaging around the world, you couldn't do magnetic resonance. Anyway, that aside, there were a lot of people claiming the Nobel Prize for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And there's no doubt that Lauterbach and Mansfield did an enormous amount. But uh, Domadian in the States has a claim. My particular hero up in Aberdeen, John Mallard, had a claim. Frank Young. Anyway, but anyway, Mansfield, Young, Mallard, all in the UK. Donald for ultrasound, UK, no ultrasound machines. And this invention was effectively a UK invention as well, really magnetic resonance imaging, and we don't produce them. So Lauterbach and uh, Sir Peter Mansfield got the Nobel Prize, quite right. And I probably don't need to tell you much about how it all works, but you do need a pretty strong magnetic field. Uh, so 15,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, it's a fairly hostile environment. And just to give you an example of how hostile it was, when we put in the first MR machine in Cambridge, nobody had a clue about how you did safety or anything. We knew that everything had to be stainless steel, which is theoretically non-ferromagnetic. And we had to get stainless steel drip stands, trolleys, wheelchairs, etc., etc. And patients, believe it or not, have been impaled in MR machines by a wheelchair that was not suitable. Um, just to give you an example of how strong this field is, we proudly had our first patient, which was somebody that had a drip in, so we had to have the drip stand. We proudly showed, them, oh, look, we've got a stainless steel drip stand. So in we go, and I was there because it was a fairly momentous occasion. To my horror, I saw the drip stand accelerating towards the magnet. And luckily, I was there, and I held it, and the casters, you know, the things that it was running on, were in the air as I pulled it back. The casters were made of brass. There was enough iron to be able to do that. So you don't go anywhere near an MR machine with your wallet because your um, credit cards are wiped clean. And uh, looking at the ladies of the audience, I can't see too much mascara, but that's a real dreadful thing. If you buy mascara from um, a cosmetic company, you're actually buying iron filings ground up, and you plaster this on. If you go into an MR machine, the iron filings go to the outside, and we are wrecked for a week. So we have to be very worried about iron filings, Kirby grips, etc., etc., etc. So it is strong magnetic field. But once the patient is in this very strong magnetic field, 
They then, of course, the protons are fakely analogous to bar magnets. This is where I'm getting out of my depth in chemistry, but anyway. Uh, there is a certain excess aligned one way to the other way, and that net excess can then be stimulated by radio frequency, as, very much like the short wave that taxis go around. We have to have a completely radio frequency shield environment um, in order to cut out strange waves. That's got much better nowadays. Then you bang in the radio frequency and the protons flip over. That's very simplistic. And then when you switch off the radio frequency, they go back and emit the radio frequency, which you listen to and reconstruct the images with coils, computers. So here we are. It's slightly more claustrophobic than computer tomography, but the imaging is exquisite. And you can get all sorts of things, and you can teach um, virtually everything on MR. So for, again, from medical school, you can be able to show where the olfactory tracts are. You can zoom up to the eye to be able to show the muscles around the eye, all with nothing touching the patient. We've done nothing other than put them into a magnet and bombard them with real radio frequency, which we, as far as we know, is as safe as anything. So that is a huge thing. And the image quality is getting better and better and better all the time. And it will probably take over much of CT. And the things that you can see, you couldn't see the spinal canal. This is back in 1986. This was a patient that was thought to have a disc there. And that was why he couldn't walk very well. But actually, if you look at the cord, you can see that the spinal cord is black there. There it's white, black, white. And these white, high signal intensity patches are areas of demyelination, and that patient has multiple sclerosis, and it does not need surgery, which they were thinking of doing. Hence, I can show that this imaging has an effect on the management, because it would have been inappropriate to operate on this disc. Whereas it would be totally appropriate to operate on that disc. Now, this is one of my favorite images. I can teach medical students for an hour on that image alone. I'm conscious of the time. Yes, we need to wrap up in a moment or two. Um, you do realize that you go to bed at night not to sleep, but to recharge these discs with water. Because during the day, the discs become dehydrated, and you need to have nice discs between all your vertebrae. These discs are degenerate. This one is so degenerate that there is a herniation and a uh, sciatica as a result of that. I'm going to skip a little bit now, because I want to get on to functional imaging. The prostate, we've cracked breast imaging virtually. Mammography, magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, no more invasive breast surgery at all. It's all done by needle biopsy, etc., etc. It's a huge change, and it's all because of imaging. The change from radical mastectomy, partial mastectomy, lumpectomy, it's now all image guided. Likewise, prostate will be. Here is a prostate cancer in the corner there, quite a big one coming out posteriorly. But with subtle MR techniques, you can show tiny little lesions in the prostate. You think that's a good idea? Every fourth chap in this room will get prostate cancer. And I don't want to know whether I have prostate cancer or not, um, because I'm not convinced that um, getting on there that early does all that much good until you need it. But anyway, that's a personal view. But it's a tricky one. But at least imaging can give you the best possible information on which to get the decisions. Likewise, if a patient has carcinoma of the cervix, you can, with techniques, show that that little focus there is the active tocus and does have metastatic, does not need surgery and needs chemo and radiotherapy. Again, imaging showing the change. I'm going to skip over. I can show you all sorts of things with the cartilage of the knee, cruciate ligaments, but um, mass coming out there. Is it a cyst? Is it a tumor? Is this a cyst or a tumor? That's unenhanced. If we get a little bit of gadolinium, paramagnetic, completely wrecks the excretion, that takes up contrast medium and is a tumour. But there is a problem with gadolinium. It's bound in to DTPA in an innocuous form. 
If you give it to somebody in renal failure or impending renal failure, it hangs around and the chelation breaks down. And the gadolinium ions, as dissociated, gives you a horrible thing called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So again, the chemistry becomes all important. And chelation of heavy metals in Wilson's disease for copper is becoming very, very interesting. And of course, um, the lawyers love getting rid of it. <laughs> I'm then just going to finish with nuclear medicine. I'm sorry to give it po such poor thing, but nuclear medicine is where a compound labeled with a radioactive amount and we record. And it's a functional thing, and increasingly it is fused with CT. So a very straightforward osteoblastic response to skeletal metastases. This is technetium-99, one of the most widely used uh, radioactive uh, compounds in nuclear medicine, linked to diphosphonate, which is used in the bone turnover, shows you where the lesions are in the skeleton. Then with FDG, fluorodeoxoglucose, uh, and this is where the two positrons come off, you can see activity in lesions. The anatomy is not so well shown, but the activity is beautifully shown with these techniques. And in an area that I'm very interested in, in the aorta, you can see the aorta beautifully lighting up with this functional technique. And finally, newer techniques, such as is being used in Cambridge with carbon-11, showing that that tiny adrenal tumour is active and therefore is the cause of hypertension, is very useful. It allows the surgeon to go straight in on that with no mucking about. I hope in this hour that I've shown you how imaging has come on a long way since the days of Röntgen's wife. I hope I've persuaded you that it does help focus down on the diagnosis, and I hope I've persuaded you that it does also help management and thereby the health of the patient. So there we are, medical imaging in the International Year of the Light. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we've got some time for questions now. Um, as I mentioned before, Adrian is quite hard of hearing, so if you could wait until the microphone is with you, that might help us uh, pick up the audio for him to, to answer your questions. I um, see an arm over there. The front. What's your question? Oh, there's a microphone coming. That's very good. <laughs> Sprinting down the corridor. <laughs> good. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. So uh, what about, you didn't seem to show something like they use a contrast agent like an oxide for the MRI. So... Um, the contrast agents for MRI, I didn't, I was getting rushed. I did too much on computer tomography, <laughs> I apologize. The contrast agents we use for magnetic resonance imaging are usually gadolinium linked to DTPA, which You can do iron oxide as well, right? You can use iron oxide nanoparticle, so you're going to see like T2 instead of T1? We would use T1 weighted. T2 yeah. weighting, we would... We're getting now into minuci. Um, in magnetic resonance imaging, there are very many different sequences that you can use. So one of the simplest is just to get a proton density map. Then you can look at the T1 weighting, how the protons relate to the lattice they're in, or you can get an image of T2 weighting, which shows you how one proton reacts with adjacent protons, the spin-spin interaction, or you can get a diffusion map to see how the protons are diffusing out. So there are hundreds of different of techniques for MR. And this is a subject of great research because you can't keep the patient there for an hour and a half while you do all these. You've got to work out which is the best sequence and the most effective sequence. It's quite expensive running an MR machine. And if you can get away with a T1 and a T1 with contrast agent and two sequences, and that can be much cheaper, even allowing for the cost of the gadolinium, which is about £67 a pop. So it's a very tricky um, uh, economical argument. But there are very few contrast agents that have stood the test of time other than gadolinium. 
Um, there are some iron, iron particles, but they've been shown to be rather dangerous. Throughout the century, you see the progression of different techniques. So yes. now they're going to have a magnetic particle imaging coming out. So like before you said that you need got the Pope and President got you know, got hurt before something technology developed. So if we've got a new technology like M MPI, magnetic particle imaging, what do you think political thing need to be happen before the new technology can be accepted? Or do we, you know? Um, I mean, all these things are possible. Uh, they've got to be quick and easily applicable to a population. You can see, I mean, the most tailor-made, personalized imaging could be nuclear medicine, using your wonderful chemical formulae to link in with various agents and focus down to that. And I can see that certain cancers have certain antigens, and then you can have certain antibodies and label them to gadolinium. But the cost of doing it for a particular tumor, so hence, straightforward, simple sequences, simple gadolinium, will probably win out in the same way that just straightforward FDG imaging in PET. But what is increasingly happening, and I think this may be what you're talking about, is fusing, and I showed you a couple of examples, of fusing the activity overlaying on the anatomy. And so hybrid imaging, MR, PET, CT, PET, will all come on, I'm sure. But um, it's going to be a while before they're widely available on the NHS, I think. <laughs> There's one back there. <clears throat> Sorry, I lip read a bit, so I'm coming to you. Um, are these imaging, new imaging techniques, more useful for people of all ages or just those near the end of their life? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know that more and more money is spent on people in the e end of their lives. You know, the last year and the first year are the two most expensive years in health. But um, the drive has got to be early diagnosis. And in fact, the government are doing all the right things on that of trying to get people to go to their GP earlier. Hence, we need tests that can reliably say normal or abnormal. And that is the drive. And I think you ask about end of life. No, I think that really these techniques should be equally applicable. However, we would like to use ultrasound in children wherever we possibly can because of the radiation dose, which may or may not exist. Then we would like to use MR in children rather than CT. The hitch is that MR is rather slow and the patient has to stay still, therefore the patient sometimes has to be anaesthetized. What is the risk of anaesthetizing a five-year-old versus a bit of radiation, fine balance? So not, in fact, I got very heavily involved in writing radiological guidelines for this country and other countries. It isn't one size fits all, shape of the patient. Far East ultrasound is fantastically good I would do a work in Hong Kong and China. Patients tend to be very thin. Ultrasound is marvelous. Ultrasound's never caught on in America because the patient <laughs> is fat. Uh, difference age, etc., etc. So uh, the female pelvis ultrasound is marvelous. Fill it up, you can see all the things, and the, that's why uh, uh, fetal ultrasound is so good. I see an arm there and an arm there. What about using blood as a contrast agent? Sorry? What about using the patient's blood as yes, contrast agent? Yes, you can agent? indeed use the patient's blood. And John Griffiths at St George's now in Cambridge has done a lot of work on using flowing blood. You can actually use the flowing blood itself, because in MR the blood flows. And you can also uh, use clever MR techniques using the oxygenation of blood and um, bold, um, oxygen-enhanced um, techniques. So you can use the patient's blood as contrast agents, and you can get very good angiograms without any contrast agent at all. Correct. There's one at the back, I think. What do you think about the trend towards preventative imaging? 
as in screening. So pe people with a lot of money are now paying to have full body MRI scans <laughs> when they're perfectly healthy. Yes. And the, the conundrums that that presents when you find these small nodules that might be something or might not be something. I've got another uh, talk in, in Davos a few years ago in the goodies handbag and at the Oscars one year, uh, you were given a certificate to have a free MR scan of the whole body. Um, it's very tricky. If you are a 50 cigarette a day person and you're highly likely to get lung cancer, I can see some mileage in having an annual CT of the lungs. But if you are not, let's take the other side of the coin, and um, a patient, it's quite a well-known case, goes for lung screening. A nodule is found, a biopsy is done, a pneumothorax happens, an empyema develops, and the patient dies. So you need one or two patients who are absolutely normal for that to go wrong. And I'm not going to start off the um, breast screening controversy. But every woman now who is screened between the ages of, let's say, whatever it is, it's about 45 to 70 now, will have a cancer scare in their life because no radiologist is perfect. And we're on a terribly tricky wicket. I can find a nodule in every lung that I look at. Do I report them all? A really skilled breast radiologist will find something worrying in every mammogram. It's judgment as to whether it's called normal or abnormal. And sometimes the woman is asked to come back after six months or have an ultrasound or something and then a biopsy. And oh gosh, I got that. And it is a fine balance of first doing no harm and not making people too worried. So I'm still personally of the view that I would not, and I'm even more cavalier than that, I haven't had my PSA measured, but that's a personal decision. And on imaging, it's quite expensive and it is not without its false positives. So I think I'm linking your question with the question I had here. I think the personalized medicine will come. You will soon be able to buy, you can already buy your genetic makeup and you can see whether you've got the BRACR1 or two genes, whether your family history, you know, and are you likely to have colon cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And your genetic profile will then lead to certain targeted imaging. And that, I think, is much more likely than blunderbuss going to Woolworths and just having a whole package. I hope that's, that's a personal view. If I was running my own clinic in Harley Street, I might have a different. <laughs> of the hybrid technologies that are developing, which do you feel is the most promising? And when do you think that theranostics will make a more prevalent input in clinical situations? Well, I think that it goes back to the genetic, that I think the genetic markup coupled with cheaper personalized imaging is where we're going. In fact, we had a big meeting with the captains of industry, the captains of research a couple of years ago. We got another one in Amsterdam coming up and it's personalized imaging using targeted um, techniques. So I think that the antibody uh, antigen of tumors which are genetically predisposed will come. And I think the combination of genetics and imaging is a very interesting one. And that's where if you wanted to put money in. Whether MR PET will really take off, I have some doubts. I know that CT PET is fantastic and we'll get better and better ligands, we'll get better and better um, uh, imaging uh, compounds. And that will, I mean, they're still very expensive. The cyclotron to get the positron imaging is quite complex, but it's getting better. There was a question here, I think. Yes. Well, it was related to the earlier question, which is 
Is there a case for, uh, if you're healthy, of having a baseline uh, scan of some sort being done? The question is, is there a useful to have a baseline imaging? That is quite an interesting one. And in fact, I'm now retired, but I do think that there is an enormous amount of data on a CT, your whole body CT. And curiously, if I was going to have really serious surgery, aged 80, I might ask for whole body CT. I might like to know what my brain looked like. I might like to know what my lungs looked like. I might like to know what my vessels looked like before going to intensive care after my surgery. Because if my lungs are wrecked, my heart is dodgy, my brain is half dead, um, I think I might prefer to have gin and tonic than <laughs> a major operation. But the answer to your question will be soon available. The Rotterdam study, my colleague Gabriel Creston at Erasmus in Rotterdam, is doing a major study of a whole population of body CT, and it will tell you the normal coronary calcium in a 50, 60, 70 year old male, female. It will tell you the normal um, osteoporosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe we will be able to say, well, this patient is X standard deviations away from that at a similar age and sex. But um, maybe, at, I mean, there's no doubt that a previous image is very useful. Mm. You know, if you have a chest X-ray mm. and you see something and you have one from four years ago and it's unchanged, that's fantastically helpful. Mm. So the baseline is useful. I will give you that. How are we doing? I think it's been a long day. I think yeah. they've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> <But>. <laughs>